Good afternoon from Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. And mabuhay to all of you, Filipino American brothers and sisters. Happy Mother's Day to all our mothers in attendance today. We are streaming live through the Blue Jeans platform and on the Facebook Live on the Philippine Consulate General in New York Facebook page. I am Dr. Romel Rivera, the president of the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, APPA or APA, one of the organizers of the Filipino American Health Forum. The subject of today's presentation is xenophobia and racism in the midst of COVID-19. It is but fitting that we are all here today to discuss this in the backdrop of celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. The month of May, as you may well know, is the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. As we celebrate our cultures, our traditions, our successes, and our histories with our Asian American and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters, we also share with them the pain, the grief, the suffering brought about by racial harassment, racial bias, and aggression during the COVID-19 pandemic. As Filipino Americans, we also have our share of bias, harassment, aggression during this pandemic, which may be reminiscent of the anti-Filipino riots and the absolutely no Filipinos allowed signs in the 1920s in the farming communities of Central California. A question that comes to mind is whether COVID-19 brought these long varied historical experiences out and has given a new opportunity for other Americans to show their resentment and anger to us. The other question, and the more important question is, what do we Filipino Americans do about this? The organizers of the Philippine American Health Forum have invited an esteemed and high powered panel of Filipino Americans to discuss these questions. They'll be introduced and have their talk very shortly. At this time, I ask my co-organizers to say a few words. First, Dr. Marie Ortaliz, the president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. My name is Marie Ortaliz, president of the Philippine Nurses Association of New York. The organization strives to promote professional development of nurses in the state of New York through education, research, community outreach, and connecting with professional organizations. Today, our topic on xenophobia and COVID-19 is very relevant as many Asian American, American communities are suffering from anti-racial violence because of COVID-19. And this is in addition to the fear of contracting the disease. United Nations experts on March 26 have expressed that uh, that we have to maintain human rights while caring for the public who are sick with COVID-19. So today we're going to hear from our panel of experts that will enlighten us how to mitigate socially, politically, and government uh, and government as well, so that we can uh, alleviate our fellow Filipino Americans. Now we have Dr. Emerson Ia chair of Kalusugan Coalition as the next organizer. They, uh, thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Uh, Kalusugan Coalition is very pleased to co-organize and co-host this health forum series on COVID-19. As a community organization dedicated to advancing the health and well-being of Filipino Americans, we are very well aware of the many psychosocial factors that impact health among Filipinos. Among minority groups in the United States, self-reported racial discrimination is associated with a wide range of health outcomes, including high blood pressure, depression, substance use, and other health problems. The topic for this forum today is important in the midst of this pandemic and during the celebration of our Asian American Pacific Islander 
Heritage Month. This pandemic has touched every one of us, and this health forum is our way to inform and empower the Filipino American community. We thank you for your participation, and we look forward to an engaging dialogue during a Q&A session. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Garcia, the chair of the National Federation of Filipino American Associations, NAFA, New York chapter. Thank you, Dr. Emerson. Hello, my name is Laura Garcia. As um, Dr. Emerson had mentioned, I am the state chair for NAFA New York. NAFA's mission is to promote the welfare and well-being of Filipino Americans throughout the United States by amplifying their voices, advocating on behalf of their interests, and providing resources to facilitate their empowerment. Some of our advocacies include promoting collaboration on issues affecting Filipino Americans in the areas of education, health, immigration, human rights, and many others. NAFA partners with local affiliate organizations and national coalitions in advocating for issues of common concern. Issues on human rights, xenophobia, and racism are common concerns, especially during these unprecedented and challenging times of COVID-19. With you in mind, this PhilAm Health Forum was designed. So welcome to the fourth series of the PhilAm Health Forum. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Angelico Razon, who is the committee co-chair of the Council for Young Filipino American Physicians of the Association, Association of Philippine Physicians in America, or APPA. Dr. Razon. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Hello, everyone. My name is Angelica Razon, or ECO for short. And I am one of the co-chairs of the Council for Young Filipino American Physicians, or CFAP. As a part of APPA, our vision is to amplify the voices of our members, patients, and community, and inspire every Filipino American medical student, trainee, and physician to be an effective change agent in the community's most pressing issues and health priorities. Um, I am excited to be collaborating with several PhilAm organizations and leaders on this important topic, especially for Asian and Pacific Islander American Heritage Month. Um, so just as a reminder, this event is being recorded so that it can be shared later with others not able to join the live event. Uh, and you can check our event bright for future events and YouTube for previous recordings. Uh, please remember when view to, uh, re viewing virtual events, please be in a quiet location and mute your audio when not speaking. Uh, and because we're having a larger panel today, you might want to also mute your, uh, your camera as well. If you have questions for your panelists after the initial pre uh, presentations, uh, please use the chat box on the side. Uh, don't forget to introduce, introduce yourself with your name and state and specify if your question is for a particular individual or the entire panel. Uh, Dr. Ia will be monitoring the chat box for questions and comments. Uh, so for those of us at the, uh, for those of viewing us at the Philippine Consulate, Consulate General uh, Facebook page, you can also message your questions on the live stream. And in general, email us for questions and comments and other topics of interest for future events. Our goal for this series is to build community and share information. So if you are a lo loved one is having a medical concern, please seek attention from your healthcare provider. This is an evolving phenomenon in every, uh, localities, public health situation is different. So please refer to cdc.gov, coronavirus.gov, and your local Department of Public Health for the most up-to-date information. Again, all these links are being shared uh, in the chat box and will be also shared on the YouTube video. Uh, Dr. Rivera uh, will now continue with the rest of our program. Before we go to the uh, panelists, um, I'd like to introduce to you the Philippine Consul General in New York, the Ambassador Claro Cristobal, who is our partner and a good support for our Filipino American Health Forum. Ambassador. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. And uh, good afternoon from New York and uh, to the rest of the world, good day. This uh, medical forum on COVID-19 has been reaching not just the lives, but also the minds and hearts of very many Filipinos all over the world. And for that, I thank uh, the Association of Philippine Physicians in America, the Philippine Nurses Association, the Kalusugan Coalition, uh, the NAFA for uh, organizing, sponsoring, and hosting this very important uh, forum uh, series. 
today's uh, topic is indeed one of the most weighty and important topics that uh, the forum has so far addressed. A few days back in New York, one Filipino nurse uh, practitioner suffered harassment from somebody riding with him in the New York subway that charging him that he brought the infection with him to this part of the world. Most of you are doctors, nurses, and you know that cannot be true. COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, won't ever respect race, won't even differentiate nationality. No one of any color can be immune to it. In other words, COVID and xenophobia and racism cannot live side by side. This is weighty and this may even be controversial, but this topic is most important and must be addressed. They cannot be swept under the rug. These are issues that affect our daily. And so thank you so much, our dear friends who will serve as resource persons for today. And uh, I hope that we, we address the issue with great clarity, with courage, and with an object to learning. Learning that we are of one and only one human race. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I want to put, give back the microphone to Antonio to uh, move on with the panelists. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio Moya. I am a neurologist working in Los Angeles, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Mr. Edwin Tablada, our first speaker today. So Edwin Tablada is the Chief of Staff at the New York City Commission on Human Rights the agency responsible for the enforcement of the New York City Human Rights Law, which is one of the most comprehensive anti-discrimination laws in the country. He has overseen some of the commission's most impactful work, including a report on discrimination and bias experienced by Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers, the implementation of the Stop Sexual Harassment in New York City Act, and the agency-wide response to COVID-19 discrimination. Previously, Edwin worked at Lambda Legal, a national legal organization committed to achieving full recognition of the civil rights of LGBTQI people and people living with HIV through impact litigation, education, and public policy work, where he focused on advocacy issues around criminal justice reform, policing, and government misconduct, as well as the development of educational and outreach efforts. Edwin is a proud Filipino, hailing from Baguio City, and currently lives in Brooklyn. Hello again, uh, and a happy Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month to all. As was uh, stated previously, my name is Edwin Tablada. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am the Chief of Staff at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. For those who don't know, the New York City Commission on Human Rights is the civil law enforcement agency uh, in New York City that is tasked with enforcing and educating on the New York City human rights law one of the most robust and protective anti-discrimination laws in the country. Basically, anywhere you live, breathe, work, or exist in New York City, you are protected by our law. Um, we can order the payment of monetary damages for emotional harm caused by discrimination, levy civil penalties for violations of the law, 
get policy changes, uh, get trainings done, or other affirmative uh, remedies. Uh, as a proud Filipino immigrant, and as was stated, I was born in Baguio City, I'm so excited uh, to be joined today by some amazing leaders and advocates. And I'd also like to say how proud I am to be a part of local government during this time, specifically at the commission, as we do our work combating discrimination bias in New York City. So we know historically that in times of crisis or pandemic, there's often a group or a category of people who are scapegoated. And I'll leave brilliant co-panelists to speak to more in detail. Um, and at the same time, we face this unique misconception that there's no such thing as anti-Asian racism or discrimination, which we know is false. And at the commission, we have in fact tracked a steep rise in anti-Asian discrimination and bias over the last three months of February, March, and April. Um, we've tracked over 300 COVID-19 related incidents uh, broadly and over 120 of those or nearly 40% were anti-Asian. We also know uh, across the country there's been a sharp increase in anti-Asian discrimination. Uh, we at the commission have been working with New York City's API communities since January on forums, town halls, bystander intervention trainings, and other programming educating the members of the public about their rights and their protections under the local laws. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the fantastic bystander intervention trainings being organized by our friends at Hollaback Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Our, our team was able to join some of those and, and it, they were um, from a, a readout, fantastic programs. I know that there's, there's more coming up. Uh, since New York State's pause restrictions went into effect, our team has gone totally virtual bringing these same public event, uh, education events online. Uh, we've also formed a dedicated COVID-19 response team with staff from our Law Enforcement Bureau and our Community Relations Bureau, which uh, is dedicated to tracking and responding to incidents of COVID-19 related discrimination. We also understand the, uh, the great importance of having resources and programming in the actual languages spoken by communities and constituents and to that end have developed materials and videos and will continue to host events in multiple languages, also Asian languages, that uh, help explain people's rights under the New York City Human Rights Law. At the commission, we speak over 30 languages and we are well aware that language access should not be a barrier to accessing programming or to reporting. I also want to acknowledge uh, some of the racial disparities that we've been seeing coming up in medical treatment facilities particularly in Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities. Uh, I think we all know that this pandemic is bringing renewed attention to long-standing disparities in healthcare due to structural and interpersonal racism. Uh, in New York City, hospitals, clinics, and other medical settings are a public accommodation under the New York City Human Rights Law, and you can report any discrimination or harassment that occurs there. Uh, the reality is, all of us uh, in New York City, where I am, across the U.S. and across the world, are, are navigating really unprecedented fears. But racism and discrimination should not be among them. Uh, we know that discrimination also takes an enormous toll on mental health at a time where our collective mental health is already suffering. Um, I understand that reporting can be intimidating, uh, but I urge you uh, and uh, anybody on this call and anybody who can hear this message to please report incidents of bias and discrimination to the, either the Commission on Human Rights if you're in New York City or a similar entity in your city uh, or state. And I think there's going to be a slide now with ways to contact the Commission and uh, 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 a link to our website. So in closing, if you experience or witness discrimination or harassment at work, at home, or in any public place in New York City, Please call 311, ask for human rights, or visit us. You can report anonymously or, or through the, uh, our online form at nyc.gov slash human rights. If you'd like to schedule trainings or partner on programming with our team, please also feel free to reach out. And this information is on the slide here. For, for specific COVID-19 resources, visit us at nyc.gov slash stop COVID hate. Uh, and thank you very much again for having me on this panel, and I look forward to answering any questions. So our next speaker is Dr. Robin Magalit uh, Rodriguez. Uh, Dr. Robin Magalit Rodriguez is currently professor and chair 
of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Davis. She is also the founding director of the Bolosan Center for Filipino Studies, the first of its kind in the University of California system and nationally focused on the Filipino experience in the United States. Rodriguez is an immigration expert. Her writing has focused significantly on the Philippine labor diaspora, but she also examines migration and a comparative perspective, particularly linking and relating the migration experiences of Asians and Latinos. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez is presently at work co-authoring a sixth book on the contemporary Filipino immigrant experience in the U.S. and her doctoral, uh, with her doctoral student, Roy uh, Tagueg. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robin Rodriguez. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for organizing this really important event um, and for having me. So just quickly, uh, because I think some of uh, what I'd like to be able to focus on maybe are the things that haven't yet been said. Uh, but uh, really, I have three main points, and that's to talk about uh, kind of anti-Asian and anti-Filipino hate in this context, especially going to focus on what we don't know, because I think many of the speakers have already alluded to what we do know, which is that anti-Filipino and anti-hate is happening. Uh, I want to touch on anti-Filipino hate historically, the ways it's worked from kind of vigilantism to, to law. Again, it's sort of been mentioned a little bit. I want to kind of um, highlight some of that. And finally, talking a little bit about uh, beyond hate crimes, what are some of the impacts of COVID-19 on the Filipino community to share a little bit about uh, the work we've been doing at the Blue Sun Center and particularly the findings from our um, our survey that's really been focused on understanding better uh, what the impacts are for, for our community. Next slide, please. So just to start with just what's happening in terms of anti or Asian and Filipino hate during this time. Uh, what do we know? Again, you know, we, we do know this and, and the reporting has been happening in various different spaces. Um, I, I, there have been already um, mention of some of the other hotlines that exist. Right now, the Blue Sun Center is partnered specifically with the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning, Planning Council. They do have a Tagalog incident report reporting mechanism. Um, we know we're being targeted by anti-Asian bigotry and hate. It's ranging in lots of ways, ostracism, verbal assaults, physical assault, a whole range of types of physical assault, et cetera. I think what I'd like to talk to speak to, though, is what we don't know. And that is that Filipinos are experiencing incidents that they do not want to characterize as anti-Asian hate or racism. And I think um, this is really important, and I'm hoping that we really start to challenge this within our community. Uh, because oftentimes, unless it is explicit, we often may just attribute these incidents to ignorance. I've already heard that um, in, in kind of my own immediate circles as different forms of violence uh, that have happened during this period are just being kind of um, dismissed as probably just uh, the consequence of ignorance. And, and I would actually like to argue, and I think I sh uh, uh, there are many scholars who would also uh, share this perspective, that what we, what we have here and this inability, I think, among many of us, is a deeply rooted uh, colonial mentality when it comes to understanding racism. Uh, we, we may not recognize the ways in which the, the legacies of U.S. colonialism have continued to shape how we think about race, racism, and white supremacy. Um, it's also rooted in a kind of, connected to white supremacy, a kind of anti-blackness in the sense that somehow we're kind of, we think Think that racism is something that only happens to black people. We're not black people. Um, white supremacy doesn't exist in that way for us. And I think this is something uh, we all really have to grapple with as a community. And, and again, you know, I think I'm, I won't be able to speak to it kind of at great length here. I, I do want to pass, um, you know, encourage all uh, everybody on the call to, to follow the work of the People's uh, Collective uh, for Justice and Liberation. Greg Sandanyan is uh, on the call as well, because I think they're really trying to help us to really unpack and confront um, uh, the ways in which white supremacy works in our community and how anti-blackness works uh, to the point that we may even misrecognize or fail to recognize the ways in which um, these kinds of hate crimes are happening um, in our community. Next slide, please. So I'll talk just again really, very, very briefly on anti-Filipino hate historically. It's been touched a little bit um, uh, earlier on, uh, but I do want to say that, you know, we have to understand that uh, very we have been very much as a community impacted by various forms of anti-Asianism, various forms of anti-Asian hate, and they range in, in um, from the kinds of things that we might be seeing um, in kind of our everyday lives now uh, in many communities. 
um, uh, escalated even to forms of vigilantism and even encoded in law. Uh, for those who don't have a familiarity with our Filipino American history, uh, you know, in the 1930s, uh, nearly a century ago, there were race riots against the Pacific War Northwest, anti-Asian riots, including a very explicitly anti-Filipino riots. They took place in places like Exeter, California, Watsonville, California, leading often even to murder. Um, these kinds of anti-Filipino uh, riots really eventually became encoded in law in what became the Tidys McDuffie Act, of the, basically a Filipino immigration ban that limited Filipino migration to only 50 a year. Uh, the next year, uh, that even escalated to a Repatriation Act that was basically to pay Filipinos to go back. It was sort of an active deportation campaign. Uh, by 1946, we even see that manifesting a kind of anti-Filipino-ness in the Rescission Act, which annulled the benefits to World War II uh, veterans, and even kind of moving forward into the early 2000s and our more recent history on um, the ways in which after 9-11, with changing immigration and national security policies, those two would have very anti-Filipino impacts. Um, uh, in, in, in many ways, uh, Filipinos, um, uh, there was this notion uh, that really, I think, uh, uh, undergirded some of the laws that somehow immigrants more broadly were responsible for the 9/11 uh, 9/11 acts, and and that uh, that they should be eliminated from uh, positions working as airport security uh, screeners. You hear see there a photo of of uh, those who were organizing here in the Bay Area. But the point is that you see these the ways in which um, kind of anti asianness anti Filipino sentiment is is really has been very present in American society for quite some time. We need to see that this is not something distinct to COVID. It is very much about how we continue to have these structures organizing American society to this day that we have to really grapple with as a community. Next slide, please. So I just want to speak uh, very uh, quickly about uh, just beyond hate, what are the, some of the other impacts of COVID-19 on Filipinos? Again, I'm very uh, conscious of the time limitations that we have, and I, and I do uh, thank all of you for taking a moment out of your Saturday to, to, to listen in with us. But we have launched, the Belusan Center has launched a major survey. Uh, initially, it was a national survey kind of broadly looking at Filipino American health and um, well-being. Uh, but, uh, and we launched that in late February. But really, um, we, we recognized that we had to do something much more specific to COVID-19. Uh, the truth is there's very, very little um, quantitative data or kind of empirical data on Filipinos. We can go into why that is, but nevertheless, uh, we have uh, launched a survey. We have nearly 700 respondents already, um, and that's just kind of on the survey, but also we've done uh, these, what are we calling talk story and quintuhan sessions. But a couple of things that we're finding, of course, and, and again, this is stuff we already know, but I think we now we have the data if in case there are those who might question um, our anecdotal kind of evidence or the stories that we have to share about our lives. We are overrepresented in healthcare, at least in our uh, survey. And again, I think we all know this. Who doesn't have a Filipina nurse or a Filipino healthcare worker in their family? I am the daughter of a nurse. Um, but, you know, 40% of our respondents have at least one member of our household in, in healthcare. And you can imagine, of course, what that means in terms of increased risk to exposure to COVID-19. We're overrepresented as essential workers. 60% of, of our respondents have at least one member of the household employed as an essential worker. Despite all of that, our people, 13% uh, of our respondents are feeling that their employers, uh, only 13% uh, feel that their uh, employers actually provide adequate PPE, which is a relatively small number. Um, if we can kind of advance the slide again, please, uh, in terms of some other uh, findings. Um, it might be a little bit difficult to, to see here, but in effect, you know, there are other um, uh, factors about the Filipino community that make us especially vulnerable at this time. The undocumented population, uh, for example, um, just in the state of California alone, it's so difficult to, to, to estimate these numbers. But we, you know, based on kind of some of our calculations, we can have up to 75,000. This is just in California alone, mind you, who are undocumented. And most of the research indicates, of course, that re regardless of what your, your ethnic or racial background is, if you are undocumented, you are um, all the more vulnerable uh, during um, pandemics generally. And we can imagine this is also true. And I think there's more and more um, evidence to suggest that this is true, of course, even now. Um, again, with uh, just repeating somewhat what was said before, but 18% um, or nearly 20% of the nurse population in California is Filipino. That's just nurses. Again, not excluding other categories of a healthcare worker. 
um, among API groups here in California, Filipinos uh, come at 24%, we comprise the majority of those working yet struggling with poverty. And you can imagine now with many, many people out of work, what that might mean then um, in this crisis to, um, uh, to, to have to deal with hunger, uh, poverty. And of course, many of us still continue to lack healthcare insurance. Um, and finally, we do suffer from a greater prevalence of specific kinds of respiratory and other health issues that make us especially vulnerable, uh, to, uh, to, uh, um, serious, um, uh, it's really um, struggling um, should we contract uh, COVID-19. And so for the final slide, please. Just a couple of next steps for what I hope that we kind of walk away from from this presentation and also from just the, the discussions today. I do encourage everybody to report. There are multiple ways one can report um, and that will be spoken to by other presentation presenters on the on the uh, in this panel. Uh, we are are working in partnership specifically with uh, the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. There is a reporting form in Tagalog, so that should um, help. Uh, two, I do encourage people to please take the survey. Add um, help us to better uh, really get that fine grained uh, uh, data that we can all use. Um, to be able to ensure that Filipinos, uh, wherever we may live, that um, our the particular ways in which we experience COVID-19 um, are being addressed by our policymakers, our public health, um, uh, public health, uh, uh, public health professionals, a, a, a whole range of people who make who can make decisions about our lives during this time. Uh, you know, we're already seeing some of the positive impact that some of our data is producing just locally. So take the survey, also take a kwentuhan. Um, that allows us to not just have this raw survey data, but also to actually share those stories. Because those stories are very, very powerful. When people share stories, for example, um, you know, we have a story here of, you know, an elderly woman who was mugged on her way to church um, to deliver a check to the church during this time. There are stories uh, everywhere about how we're experiencing COVID, and we need to be able to lift those up. Uh, my PhD student, uh, Roy Tagig, who is also um, the research director for the center, is helping to coordinate that. You can email him here. And also try to keep up to date on the, the work. We are pushing out kind of analyses and research nearly every week. We are pushing out the survey, expanding the scope of our work, and hoping that all of this, you know, they say knowledge is power, and we're hoping that with this knowledge, we can better empower ourselves in this time and in the future beyond in the kind of post-COVID world. And I'll just end there. And Thank you again so much, Dr. Rodriguez. Now I'll be presenting a uh, fellow Bruin, uh, Mr. Gregory Sandana. Uh, Mr. Gregory Sandana is a president of Can't Stop, Won't Stop Consulting. Uh, he was the first openly gay and youngest ever executive director of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance and former president of the United States Student Association. Gregory is the immediate past chair of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans co-founder of Inclusive, that's I-N-C-L-U-S-V, and serves on the board of the United We Dream and 18 Million Rising. Gregory has been named one of Washington, D.C.'s most influential 40 and under young leaders, one of the 30 most influential Asian Americans under 30, D.C.'s inaugural Power 30 Under 30 award recipient, and the future of D.C. politics. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram, at Gregory Sandana. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you so much, Antonio, for that um, introduction, and thank you to all the organizers for um, the invite. Um, this is a critical conversation, and I think especially um, to be able to come together with other Filipino Americans across the country to, to address um, the rising xenophobia and racism, I think is really important. Um, as, the, as the slides are coming up, um, I wanted to just name that we are um, in a unique moment, um, and that it's a, that we are all being impacted. Um, next slide, please. And um, we're all being impacted in different ways. And so we'll t my hope is that we'll be able to talk a little bit about that. Um, I just wanted to just quickly do an introduction to just share a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I think um, Antonio gave a lot of my introduction, gave a lot of introduction, but I wanted to just share some other people and um, family and loved ones in my life because I think especially in this moment. Um, it's important to remind uh, us of why we do this work, why we can, why we um, need to continue to press forward, um, and even if we are feeling lonely, increased stress, whatever it may be, um, that there are different reasons and things that we can be grateful for and hopeful for. Um, 
Uh, one thing that I will share is that um, I was the first Filipino American to serve as the chair of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. Um, and um, just continue to be grateful for the folks who come before us to help pave the way and allowed for uh, people like me to be able to take on leadership roles and continue to provide support and nurturing. Um, I think I, just to kind of dig into this a little bit more, you know, folks are being impacted by COVID-19 and the coronavirus in different ways. Um, and I think it's okay to name that, to be able to um, get the support and the resources that we need for um, our physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, environmental, and occupational health. Um, I know that sometimes it's hard for us to talk about these things because we are embarrassed, we are um, concerned of what people may think, and we really have to, um, I, I'd like to create space and I'd like to encourage more folks to be able to uh, share and talk about some of these things because in order for us to be able to move past um, and to heal, um, we actually have to mourn and grieve and name the, the ways in which we're being impacted, whether someone in our family or somebody we know was has died or has been impacted or even our, uh, we ourselves um, have faced symptoms or um, contracted COVID-19. Like these are all different um, real experiences for people and have to be mindful of the impact that it has. Um, I think to kind of um, build on things that um, Dr. Rodriguez was, Rodriguez was saying is that um, for me, this pandemic is also showing the holes and gaps in many of the systems um, um, and, and, uh, and making those holes and gaps more visible and clear. So, you know, I'll, I'll name some here in, in, the, in terms of context, but for example, when we're talking about election, elections, and elections and voting. Um, we, there's a need for expanding vote by mail, automatic, reg, automatic voter registration. Um, when we're thinking about the economy, you know, right now there was just a recent a report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and there are now more than 30 million people who are unemployed in this country. These are some of the lowest unemployment rates since the Great Depression, um, and um, that doesn't even include undocumented. That, that those numbers doesn't even include undocumented folks or folks who work underneath the table. Um, and so the number is likely higher in terms of um, the kind of impact that that's having on folks. Um, you know, healthcare, you know, uh, so, some folks also mentioned this earlier in the panel, the lack of PPE, the lack of, of masks, um, and the need for hazard pay or, uh, or, and, or protections for workers. And there's also been an opening conversation about healthcare, who has healthcare, who has access to testing, um, and is, is universal health care something that we should actually be striving for in the United States? Um, and and, and health care that's not tied to employment or health care that's not tied to immigration status. Um, education, you know, uh, in, in this time that we are, we are practicing physical distancing, um, we are also recognizing that people, not everyone has access to the same technology and wireless, that not all educators necessarily were prepared to um, um, to, 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 to deal with this and are not given, be, being given the proper resources and support to be able to support students and families during this, during this particular moment. Um, housing, you know, uh, there's, there's been a lot more conversation around a housing guarantee and what does it look like to have to cancel rent or mortgage um, to, in these times when people are, are struggling economically um, and financially. Um, and, and to name it, white supremacy, you know, you know, I think that there's an important balance of while we want to center and address anti-Asian racism and anti-Filipino uh, uh, racism um, that we also, and, and, and xenophobia overall, we must make the connections to other historical um, uh, pieces, everything from Vincent Chin, the internment of Japanese Americans, the Chinese Exclusion Act, post 9-11 surveillance, and you know, and even some of the history, the earlier history, even earlier history of the country um, with native ge native genocide and the slavery of Africans, um, and how all that's connected to white supremacy and the 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 divide and and the how much of the divide and conquer continues to try to um, uh, permeate um, our communities. Um, and then, and um, in terms of the response, I think the biggest thing that I like to share with folks is that solidarity and co-conspiracy co is critical to our survival, and it's also critical to our collective justice and liberation. 
Um, and so just, just quickly in terms of um, solidarity and co-conspiracy um, or co-conspirators, um, it's in, you know, I have some uh, quotes here that I think really sum up well for, um, of what it means. So solidarity is vital, from, this is from Deepa Iyer, is vital um, that, that then that when we connect issues, people and experience together to reach our shared goals of collective power, mutual liberation, inclusion, equity, and healing. Um, and co-conspiracy, um, this is from um, Alicia Garza, who is co-founder of Black Lives Matter, is about what we do in action, not just in language. And it is about um, moving through guilt and shame and recognizing that we, we did not create none of this and that, um, and that what we're taking responsibility for is the power that we hold to transform our conditions. And that last piece, I really wanna um, underscore, power that we hold to transform our conditions. Now you may be asking, well, what, how do we do this? And so um, this, this, this next slide is um, around guiding principles. And when we talk about um, solidarity and co-conspiracy, we must center those directly and disproportionately impacted. Are the people who are closest to the pain, are they also closest to the solutions and closest to the, decision make, the decisions that are being made by organizations and campaigns? Um, also, there's a, to be mindful that there are many ways to take action. You know, some people, I, I think that there's power in even actually having critical conversations with your family and, and actually pushing them to say, how are, we, how are you actually addressing anti-Blackness in our, in our communities? How are you actually supporting other Asian Americans and other Filipino Americans in this moment? Um, um, you know, are, there's also going to protests or going to actions. And e even though we're practicing physical distancing, there are many different ways to do this um, that is safe, um, but still could also make sure that our elected officials and other people, um, other decision makers know where we are at. Um, this also includes running for office. This, um, and, and, and there's also just other different kinds of roles that could be played. Um, you know, I always get asked like, well, how, how do you also like, why is it like, how do you actually build with, with people? And for me, it's like, we actually, it's, it's really at, at the core, at the, the building blocks of building genuine relationships. Um, building genuine relationships for understanding um, and towards collective um, power and liberation, that there's this sense that um, my liberation is tied to your liberation and that when we lift up and we fight for the most marginalized, we lift all of us up. Um, and then, um, you know, that it's important to share space, move resources or donate to causes and movement organizations. You know, there are many folks who are um, lucky to eat, be able to work from home. Many people are able to, uh, lucky to, to still be employed in this moment. And I shared some of this, the uh, unemployment numbers earlier. And so if you are in a position to give, then give. If it's, if it's time, if it's money, if it's love and joy and art, then I, then give in the, those ways. Um, and then the, the best opportunities usually include food, arts and culture. And I know that many in our, in our community um, know, that, know that as well. I know that uh, we're, I just wanna just go quickly talk about um, the People's Collective for Justice and Liberation, which um, Dr. Rodriguez uh, uh, talked a little bit about earlier. Thank you for mentioning that. But this is an effort where Filipino and Asian American organizers have come together to provide um, intervention to not only address anti-Asian racism, but to also build cross-racial solidarity with other people of color and mar marginalized communities. I just wanted to shout out um, fellow Filipino-American who's also a co-founder, um, DJ Cutton Candy of Asian Solidarity Collective in San Diego. Um, uh, we, we launched a Building Solidarity Town Halls and we'll be uh, soon launching COVID Campus, which really is about giving insight to community organized uh, community organizers, leaders, and organizations to educate, politicize, and call to action um, the next generation and a new class of social justice um, uh, folks. And then we have our next town hall on um, May 23rd around structural racism and the importance of cross-racial solidarity. Check out our website, peoplescollective4jl.org. It actually just got launched, um, so you all are some of the first folks to know. I just wanted to share my contact information in case you all wanted to reach out for a training to help with the convening or meeting. Um, look forward to continued partnership and building solidarity um, with you all. Thank you. For our uh, final speaker, we have uh, Marita Escobanez. So as Director of Strategic Initiatives for Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, Marita advocates on 
civil rights issues impacting the Asian American community and manages varied projects, including anti-hate efforts, supporting naturalization services in the DC metropolitan area, and working with Advancing Justices, uh, Justice, AAJC's community partners to produce demographic reports on Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Prior to joining Advancing Justice, AAJC, Marita was Director of Legal Services for the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center in Washington, DC. Her experience providing legal assistance to low-income communities also includes working with labor pool workers as part of the Homeless Persons Representation Project in Baltimore and advocating on behalf of migrant and seasonal farm workers with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Marita holds a law degree and bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan. Marita? Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the organizers. Um, so you've heard um, about me. I will briefly speak about my organization, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. We are a nonprofit organization that is focused on um, civil rights advocacy on issues impacting the Asian American community. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about a few initiatives from my, that my organization is running. Um, the first is um, our Stand Against Hatred website. So Stand Against Hatred is our website that we created um, in response to the rise in hate that we saw during the 2016 election cycle. So we have been working to document both hate crimes and hate incidents experienced by the Asian American population in the United States for a number of years now. Um, it's important to report both um, hate crimes, so where there is an underlying crime that is motivated by bias, as well as what we call hate incidents. Um, uh, different forms of discrimination and harassment that might not rise to the level of a crime that would be actionable by law enforcement. Um, it's important to report both because we want to know what's happening in our communities and we use this information in our communications with media and policymakers and to inform our advocacy efforts. Um, we also I do need to note that we are coordinating with the other Asian American organizations that are engaged in similar work, including the Stop AAPI Hate um, website that Dr. Rodriguez referenced. Um, and we also strive to provide assistance and resources to the community because we, while we recognize the importance of reporting and documentation, we also recognize that it's important to provide assistance to people. So I do want to note that we work very closely with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and their Stop Hate Project, which includes a hotline. The number for that is 1-844-9-NO-HATE. Um, and you can call that hotline, which is available in a number of languages, um, to access assistance, both legal assistance and social services support. Um, so. Between the organizations that are documenting um, COVID-19 harassment and discrimination, we've received many reports. Um, but it's important to note that hate is chronically underreported. Um, and, you know, the numbers that we're getting, which are already alarming, I mean, one incident is too many. Um, but the numbers that we're getting are, you know, while much of the country is still sheltering at home. Um, so we are very much concerned about what's going to happen as restrictions ease and as people, you know, are out and about and there's greater opportunity for contact and unfortunately conflict, right? So um, as part of our response, Asian Americans Advancing Justice AAJC has been offering free virtual trainings on bystander intervention with Hollaback. Um, thank you, Edwin, for the shout out for our program. Um, so Hollaback has long been providing training on how to respond to street harassment. And back in March, they approached us um, um, about a partnership to adapt their training for the current situation and to address COVID-19 harassment and discrimination. So we worked with Hollaback to adapt their training. We experienced great demand for the training. So we started offering it in April and we have already trained 5,000 people in bystander intervention. So um, I recommend the training, I'm a little biased, but I do think it's important for people to know sort of the kinds of tactics that you can use if you witness harassment or if you yourself are targeted for harassment. 
Um, it's a one hour virtual training. Um, we are offering several more in the month of May. Um, and I think it's, it will be useful for our community and for others to learn about these tactics. So hopefully we can, you know, more of us are gonna be able to intervene should we find ourselves in the situation um, where we are witnessing or subjected to hate. So the last point I wanna make is as an attorney and a civil rights advocate, um, you know, my job involves advocating for policies that serve our communities well. Um, there have been a number of legislative initiatives to improve the response to hate crimes and hate incidents. We're working to improve language access, um, help ensure that our communities are able to access the resources that are available to respond to COVID-19. Um, and we couldn't do this without support from our elected officials and from our diverse um, civil rights partners. Um, so, you know, in closing, I encourage people to speak out when you witness or experience hate, harassment, discrimination. I would like for all of us to take steps to help to take care of one another in the face of hate um, and this pandemic. And echoing a lot of the messages that Greg shared, let's, let's act in solidarity with the communities of color and allies and work to address hate and the disparities that are falling hardest on um, minority communities. Um, you know, we're all in this together and I, I hope we're able to use this moment to um, do our part to build a better world for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, great presentations, um, great take home messages for everyone. We go right away to um, Emerson. Um, do you have a question from the audience? Um, Yes, there's a question. Thank you very much uh, for the great presentations. There was a question here from Dr. Sager about reporting uh, hotline 311 for reporting of racism and xenophobia if it's outside New York City. This question is for Edwin Tablada. Our, our jurisdiction ends uh, where New York City uh, ends. Um, for any incidents that you uh, experience or witness outside of New York City that still occurs in New York State, I urge you to contact our sister agency at the state level the New York State Division of Human Rights. Uh, their uh, toll-free hotline is 1-888-392-3644. They're also available uh, uh, online if you want to visit their website. And I know that the State Attorney General's Office also has a hotline for um, reporting this discrimination. And again, as many of my co-panelists said, there is a lot of great advocacy and data collection occurring uh, at the CBO level. So please, please do try and identify either a national or local organization that is doing some of this data collection and contribute to that because as we know, uh, data drives policy, it drives funding, it drives uh, everything. So it is absolutely crucial that uh, these numbers are collected. And actually, I'd like to add that, yes, if you're outside of New York, most lo many localities and states also have Human Rights, Human Relations Commission. So quick Google search should help you identify where you can report. Well, thank you. Uh, we, in the interest of time, uh, um, can we have one more question from the chat box, um, Emerson? Uh, there is one question in here from Vanessa. I'm gonna read it out and um, anyone from the panel can address it. So she's asking about how are you addressing anti-black racism and anti-blackness in our community? So anyone from the panel uh, could address this. Yeah, so I, this is um, Greg Sandana. I, I just put a little bit in the chat, but I can just share that. Um, there's a, it kind of depends on the, the relationship, but generally I like to share folks the history of the model minority myth and um, how um, how white supremacy um, you, tries to use particularly Asian Americans, including Filipino Americans as a racial wedge, especially against other communities and particularly black communities, um, and how that was actually something that was facilitated by the state through, um, through uh, immigration policy that brought certain, certain classes of immigrants to the US and then um, the use of media to kind of lift up those narratives. I think generally though, I would recommend people to um, reach out and connect with local organizations led by um, black folks and to actually build 
um, relationships and figure out how, ways to partner. Um, in some cases, it's, it can be as simple as like hosting a, co a conversation or a dialogue um, or a panel um, similar to this, but um, curated in a way that allows for people to kind of share some of their, their experiences and how some of the struggles and some of the experiences that folks face are shared. Um, and um, uh, actually taking time to do some research and learning more about other communities and how they may be particularly impacted. So even in even right now, um, Maritza kind of mentioned just a little bit, but uh, in the midst of COVID-19, while there's a, been a rise in anti-Asian racism, uh, like a lot of those incidents haven't necessarily led to death, but black folks have been disproportionately, um, have been dying at disproportionate rates um, as, and even this, despite being maybe smaller percentages in different cities. And so how do we actually reconcile that and talk about that and say, yes, while we can address and should address anti-Asian racism and xenophobia, that can't be at the expense of our black brothers and sisters who are able to really, um, uh, who are also experiencing, experiencing it differently as well. We would like the Consul General to have uh, his final remarks, uh, Ambassador. In the very middle of our fight against this invisible but so dangerous infectious disease, we also need to fight what could be even more insidious, and that is the scourge of uh, ignorance. I am just so very happy that our uh, four resource persons really shared so much knowledge, so much wisdom that uh, do address very directly the scourge of ignorance. We are going to repeat all the uh, presentations through our Facebook uh, page. We have also started uh, updating our website so that the presentations as well as the, the uh, recordings of these as well as uh, past uh, episodes of uh, the forum series could be viewed and reviewed globally. Uh, let me inform you that uh, we continue to receive uh, viewership, increasing viewership of uh, previous iterations of these as well as other forums. Uh, but our star performer is that forum we had on immigration and unemployment. So far, we have uh, had uh, close to 50,000 views. Uh, that sim single uh, forum alone. So I would encourage those watching today, share. Let our common and joint uh, effort to vanquish the scourge of racism and the scourge of ignorance together. And we can prevail. People see that we make a difference by being a part and partner of everyone else. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Consul General Cristobal, and thank you to all my co-organizers and our distinguished panel. We have learned so much and we were enlightened with all the information. Our next uh, forum is still decided upon and will be solicited from the audience of these forums. Thank you. Thank you all for joining our fourth series of Phil M Health Forum. Got feedback? We would love to hear from you. Please send us your comments, suggestions on how we can improve our forum, and most importantly, future topics that you would like to hear. And email us at phil.m.health.forum at gmail.com. And please follow us at hashtag PhilM Health COVID-19. And thank you and see you next time. Be well and stay safe and happy Mother's Day 
to all moms out there. 